Hey everyone, thanks for tuning in to Test 2 Plus today. I am Trace, and this is episode 3 of 5 on fire. So far we've talked about what fire is, like how it's made, and we've also talked about the first time that fire showed up on Earth and how the early humans began to harness it. Today, we're gonna talk a bit about the chemistry of fire, and we're even gonna move on to fire in places that you would never expect to see it. So make sure you subscribe for this whole series. But I wanna start this episode with a fun fact. Fun fact, here we go. I'm a blacksmith. Blacksmiths take metal, heat it in fire, and then hit it really hard with a hammer. It's a good stress relief, yeah, I have a good time with that. I can't make a lot of stuff, hooks and nails and things. But in the end, you're working with hot metal and fire, so you end up burning yourself a lot. I burned my hands and my arms, you know, you just, it just happens. Burn my feet, you drop something, it goes in your boot, what are you gonna do? A lot happens to the body when skin is burned. As the temperature on your skin increases, the classifications of your burn level increase as well, what we would call different levels of a burn. But what happens is as our skin starts to experience what's called a first degree burn, the outside of your skin is injured. It's just the outside, just the surface. And your body thinks of it as an attack. So it sends cells from the immune system to come figure out what's going on. They're inflammatory mediators, making sure things don't get too tight, too inflamed and the skin's blood vessels dilate so that all of those immune cells can get there, which is why a burn turns red. More blood flow to that spot. You've seen this before. Most people who live in sunny places have had a first degree burn. You can see it as a sunburn. Also, sometimes you'll get burned by a pot really quick. You'll have a little shiny red line. That is a first degree burn. So the first degree burn, pretty mild. They heal pretty quickly. Second degree burns, a little more serious. Some people have experienced these. This is also called a partial thickness burn, and this is when your skin develops blisters. So if you have a red patch with a blister in the middle from a burn, that would be a second degree burn. The blister is caused by capillaries in your skin that have burst. They're leaking fluids and pushing the epidermis up, you know, and causing that blister. So say it was on your hand, you definitely notice. They're very painful. I've experienced these many times with the hot metal burns that you would get in blacksmithing. And many of you have probably experienced this as well. Don't pop the blister, by the way. If you have to go to the ER, maybe they will, but that would leave you open to infection. So don't do that. The third degree burn is even more serious. By the way, each of these comprise the burns before them. So your blistered skin isn't just a blister on its own. It's surrounded by a first degree burn. The third degree burn, also called a full thickness burn, all the layers of your skin are affected, not just the outer layers. And it goes all the way down to the nerve endings inside of the hypodermis. And the reason that happens is because the burn has penetrated so far into the skin and destroyed them. Hair, sweat follicles, destroyed. The skin can become pale and proteins coagulate. You can get like charred flesh. It's bad, it's really, really bad. Fourth degree burns destroy bones, muscles, tendons, and all the layers of skin as well. It's even worse. You can usually have more than one of these at the same time. So if you have a fourth degree burn, it's probably surrounded by a third, surrounded by a second, surrounded by a first. Super painful. To simplify this, they usually organize burns into two groups. The first and second go into minor burns. They're small, they're not a sensitive area. Usually you just wrap them in a light bandage and you're good to go with a little burn ointment. Major burns are any third and anything above that or areas that are sensitive, like places on the hands, the feet, the face, the groin, major joints, the buttocks, et cetera, et cetera. Those are all considered major burns because they're gonna affect your life even if they are only a second degree burn. Speaking of charred flesh, let's talk about steaks right? Delicious, delicious third degree burns. When you cook food, all of these same things happen. You are using heat to change the chemistry of flesh. This is a chemical change in the food and new substances are created during the cooking process. An energy exchange occurs and that changes the food and alters it essentially forever, right? Bread becomes toast easy, delicious toast. Bread turns brown because sugars inside of the bread, because bread is essentially a complex carbohydrate. Carbohydrates are sugars. So sugars in the bread break down and they form carbon and that turns brown 
as the sugars kind of caramelize. And if you keep going, it turns black, just like ash in a fire, because you are getting carbon, just the same as wood. You cannot reverse this. Once you've burned the toast, you burn the toast. Don't burn the toast. When you cook meat, it's kind of the same thing, right? Red meat, it's mammalian animal muscle. Fowl is a little different, chicken, turkey, and stuff. That's a little different, but all red meat is mammalian animal muscle. Pig is the other white meat, but it's actually mammal meat, so it's red meat. Meat is 75% water, around 20% protein, around 5% fat, and then there are small amounts of carbs and acids and other minerals. So when the protein molecules inside of the meat are heated, the proteins change. Normally, proteins come in coils, little bonded coils. The heat destroys the bonds, so the coils start to unwind. That's when water starts to seep out of the meat. You know, you get that nice hissy sound. And meat can lose so much water, and the proteins can uncoil so much. That's why you start with a quarter pound of hamburger, and you don't end with a quarter pound. You cook off some of that weight, because a lot of that is water. And this is a process called denaturing. You're breaking down the weak linkages or the weak bonds inside of the meat. A common consequence of denaturation is the loss of biological activity. Essentially, you're killing anything that was alive. It's funny to think about, but when you have a bright red steak that you've kept in the fridge, that's still technically living tissue. You know, it can be, especially if it's super fresh. The loss of catalytic ability of an enzyme means that eventually you're killing it. In red meat, it's red because of hemoglobin or myoglobin. It's a protein that stores oxygen inside of our red blood cells. So it's red because it still has that hemoglobin. Myoglobin in the meat reacts to heat and turns it brown. Heat triggers an iron atom oxidation and the iron atoms lose an electron and gradually change from red into brown. So that's why meat turns brown as you cook it. White meat doesn't do that the same way, right? White meat, like chicken and turkey, that doesn't have as much myoglobin, not as much iron. So it's pink when it's raw, and then it turns white as it cooks, because it's not losing electrons in the same way. This is called the Maillard reaction. It's a protein breakdown, it gives food its brown color, and it makes everything delectable, right? Once you've done this, you can't go back. You can't uncook a steak. You can't coil those proteins up again. The reason is, chemical changes. A state change is, you know, in basic science, water can be ice, can be a solid, liquid, or a gas, right? Ice, water, water vapor. Chemical changes would be like turning the water into something else, breaking the oxygen from the hydrogen and turning it into two things, completely different. So why do some chemicals change color when they're exposed to flames? Why do chemical reactions cause all these different things? Well, fire contains all of this heat, and that heat excites atoms. When atoms get excited, they sometimes break apart or change how they're processing energy. When your campfire burns, you normally see it as yellow or orange, right? When you burn wood, what's happening is the wood is releasing this volatile chemical gas, and that's burning. But wood is a dirty fuel. It's got a lot of impurities in it. Carbon in the wood becomes soot, and the hydrocarbons in the soot become this burned yellow-orange color. But you get a lot of sooty smoke, and you know that's bad. And that's because there are impurities in the wood. It's not the best fuel source. And not all flames are going to produce soot, and not all flames are going to be orange and yellow. Some things are going to be different colors. Barium burns a pale green, and it can burn. Copper, if you were to take a small bit of copper pipe and throw it into a campfire, you would see green and blue flames popping up around the copper as it burned. If you were to somehow throw calcium in there, it would turn red. Potassium burns purple. Magnesium doesn't burn with any color. The reason this happens is because of the way each of those atoms works on an atomic level. Atoms are made of positively charged nuclei surrounded by electrons, right? Looks like a tiny little solar system. And those negatively charged electrons move according to the laws of quantum mechanics. We, we Maybe you should do a video about quantum mechanics. You can let us know over on Twitter, at TestTube, or down in the comments if you want us to do that. 
But without getting too much into quantum mechanics in this episode about fire, the negatively charged electrons have to move around the nucleus in orbitals, right? Kind of like planetary orbits, like I said. As it excites, as the atom gains energy, those electrons will fly further away from the nucleus that's changing the state of the atom. And it, to move from one orbit to the next, it releases energy. The energy that's released is what is making those colors, what makes the flames. It's built of energy, of little atoms. The light emitted are photons because energy is being emitted. And the energies of those photons are determined by the energy required to move from one electron orbital to the next. A flame can have lots of different energies existing all at the same time. And when those energies change and they cause electrons to move around, the flames can change color. Copper atoms don't look like sodium atoms or potassium atoms or barium atoms. So they're going to burn with different levels of energy in different colors and temperatures. Really, really cool stuff. When an electron drops back down into a different orbital, it must release the exact same amount of energy that it absorbed. And depending on the element that you put in the flame, different photon colors are going to appear. It's very cool. I really love it. Have you ever put copper in a fire? Do you have any cool tips if you're on your next camping trip on what you could throw in the fire to make different colors? Let us know down in the comments. But tomorrow we're going to talk a bit about not building campfires in the woods and starting fires, because that's bad. Don't do it. We're going to talk about the science of firefighting and how we can stop some of these out of control fires. And even if it's a good idea, because sometimes it's not. Make sure you subscribe so you can come back and see that. You can also come find us on Twitter at TestTube. You can find me at Trace Dominguez. And thanks for watching. Wow.